All right, wonderful. So thanks for standing by for the technical difficulties. There's always something that goes on here and, and just makes it exciting, I suppose. So this is our first meeting here of our um, online course, the professional development course for educators. And this particular season, we've got um, the applied earth science focus. And we're having a webinar here with Dr. Al Warner from Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And he's going to give us some insight into his work um, with the Svalbard REU um, expedition that is currently out in the field. Um, it also might be called the High Arctic Change Expedition. That's our name for it here at Polar Trek. So uh, CICE is an acronym for Cyber-Based Interdisciplinary Science Education. So that is who's sort of the, the housing organization for our course this summer. So I really appreciate the people who are taking the course for credit and those who are joining us just for this webinar to find out what's happening in, um, in Svalbard and what Dr. Al Warner is doing with his work. Before we pass it over to Dr. Warner, I am going to show you a slide here. Your slides should be changing and now you should see one that has a, a screen capture of your Blackboard Collaborate platform. So we've been testing out microphones and seeing how things work. For you who are on the computer, if you do want to ask a question, you can certainly type it into the chat, which all of you kind of found there at the bottom on the left. And also, you can press the talk button that's just above the participant list. And when you're done, you unclick it or you know, click it again to finish talking. It's like hanging up the phone, basically. Um, so if you do have a question, you can raise your hand, which is right in the participant list above everybody's name there. And, uh, or type it in the chat box and we'll kind of take questions as we go along. So that's a little bit of what I'm always saying here. So type it in the chat box or raise your hand, um, click to talk, and then unclick when you're done. You know what we'll do? We'll, we'll test that out right now here. So for participant introductions, we can go kind of down the list because we've got a nice small audience this afternoon of teachers and educators. Um, you could name your school if you've got anybody else listening with you. And let us know if you have taken one of our courses before or if you are joined um, in this course or just to enjoy the afternoon. So Bruce, you're on there. You want to start? Oh, ma'am. Bruce, you're not quite here yet. We see you typing as well. Man, this is a tough afternoon for Blackboard Collaborate. I'm going to close off your mic there, Bruce. I'll give you um, permissions once again. And we can try it out later, but I think you might be typing or something to us. Uh, there you go. Okay. All right, Bruce, you can um, certainly type. Go right ahead. Julia, your microphone was working. Go ahead and test that out, or introduce yourself. Hey, if you can hear me, I'm Julia West. I work for Oak Meadow School. It's actually a distance learning school. I teach high school science to kids um, all over through distance learning. And I did take the course in the spring, the physical sciences course, and I really enjoyed it. And these webinars are kind of fun. so. I'm back again. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks, Julia. And Ken, I know your audio was working a minute ago. Go ahead and introduce yourself. All right, Ken, did you want uh, to try and use the audio? You yeah, were using it earlier. Oh, there you go. Any up now? Nope. Press the talk button. Talk button. And then start talking. And then start yep. talking. Yep. yep. Working on it. Any luck? Yep. 
you got it back. So should I type? How about now? Huh. So are you still hearing me? I can hear okay. you again. So can I can hear you again. Okay, great. So Ken Williams, I work in a small K-8 to school on Coastal Maine called Nobleboro Central School. I'm a 7th and 8th grade science teacher. And I'm here because a former student of mine named Seth Campbell is actually doing Arctic research. And I'm just sort of checking things out and hoping to actually join him, if possible, in a year or so. So thank you. Perfect. Nice job. All right, go ahead, Melissa. Hello. Hello, this is Melissa Barker. I'm a ninth grade biology teacher at the Alexander Dawson, Dawson School in Boulder, Colorado. I um, was up at Tulick Field Station as a polar truck teacher um, in May and part of June. And um, I'm just craving more Arctic science. So I'm not taking the course, unfortunately. I'm not able to because school starts in a couple weeks here. And uh, it gets a little crazy. So um, I'm just sitting in and excited to learn about more Arctic science. Great, Melissa. Michael, it looks like you're doing the audio wizard right now. You want to try it out and see if it works? Okay, Michael. We'll wait on you to go through that audio setup. No worries. Tammy, your microphone was working earlier. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Tammy Aurelio. I teach marine science and biology at Stoneman Douglas High School, which is in South Florida. And I'm taking the class because I'm interested in learning more about the Arctic and the Antarctic region. And I've been couple weeks in Alaska this summer, and I was up in Alaska last year as a teacher at sea. And that's about it. Perfect. Thanks. Looks like Turtle is uh, working on her audio setup. So uh, Michael or Turtle, when you're ready, in the chat box, you can tell me that you're ready. Madalena, would you like to introduce yourself? Do you have um, a microphone, a microphone to, work to work with? You can type. Uh, I try. I try. <laughs> Good evening. Here is uh, about midnight. <laughs> so um, my name is Madalena. I'm uh, from Florence, Italy. Uh, I have been taught uh, for 20 years in high school. Uh, I'm teaching. Um, uh, natural sciences, uh, mm, that is uh, chemistry, biology, uh, science, and astronomy. Uh, and uh, you are welcome in my <laughs> scorching uh, weather this evening. Perfect, Madalena. Thank you for joining us at midnight in Italy. All right, Michael, you look like you're done the audio setup. Go ahead and press the talk button and then press it again when you're done speaking. Okay, my name's Mike Dempsey from Southern Cayuga High School in upstate New York. Uh, it's just me participating at this particular time. Thanks, Michael. Turtle, looks like you still might be working on it. Would you go ahead and try and talk if you'd like to? All right, we'll let you listen in for now. But thanks, everybody, for introducing yourself. It's also a good way to make sure your mic is working or not. We've got it all squared away. 
Um, I'm going to jump here to another slide about Polar Trek. So you're all probably pretty familiar with our program, but we help to get K-12 teachers out on research expeditions uh, to the Arctic and Antarctic. We're actually going to be starting our next um, application period coming up pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, and Polar Trek is one of the partners that helps to run this online course that's beginning today and will go for the next uh, two weeks or so. So that's us, and I am going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Warner and let him take it away from here. Are you ready? I am. I am. Everybody Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Oh, oh um, so I'm, I'm hearing, hearing the mono feedback, feedback of my own, my own voice. voice. Is you know what? Point? Yeah. Yeah, we do have a feedback on you. Um, I just wonder, I know you said your computer's uh, taken care of, but is, and Skype is closed, is that right? Yeah, yeah Skype, Skype is closed. Is closed. And, and uh, let's, let's see, can I turn, turn the that talk box volume, volume down? down does that mean anything? No. no. <laughs> um, I'm not what sure what to do. If I hear you talk about that, I think it's great. Definitely don't talk. Yeah. Um, go ahead and say one more thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. Some, so your voice is coming back at you and feeding into the phone again is what's happening. So uh, the only I feel bad. The only thing I can think of is that your computer isn't actually muted. Do you mind um, muting and then unmuting or unmuting and then muting again? Yeah, let's yeah, see. So, so um, I, can, I, can, I can mute the, uh, the speakers, speakers, but, but um, um, to, to mute the, the microphone, I'm sure. sure. Uh, uh, where to mute, yeah, press the regular mute button on your computer. And it sounds like you did that, but just to do it over again. Uh, yep. It's on. Um, I wonder if Skype didn't hang up and you, your voice is coming through twice over. Um, okay, okay, let's, let's try, try that. that. I, I, I do have an icon. Yeah, I think you may have There you go. That. I heard you click off. Yep. You are ready to roll, sir. <laughs> okay. There you go. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, hi, everybody. I, uh, sorry for all the, the troubles. Um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing in Arctic Norway. I think everyone's probably aware of the fact that things are changing a lot in the, the Arctic, especially the high Arctic. Um, in fact, when I was in Fairbanks just uh, about uh, 10 days ago, um, it was really telling because the, the cab driver uh, likened the weather that Fairbanks was having to Juno, and, and he wasn't happy about it. Anyway, um, what I want to talk about is the Svalbard REU and the research that we're doing uh, with that program, and then I'll talk a little bit about my perspective on uh, teachers uh, that uh, come up with this through Polar Trek. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of ways to be concerned about climate change. There's lots of ways to think about climate change. Um, the way that I'm going to be talking about today is geology oriented. In other words, we are, as part of this, this Svalbard REU group, concerned with trying to figure out how past climate is recorded in the geologic record. And particularly, we are trying to understand what the little layers that occur in a glacial lake in the high Arctic mean with regard to changing environmental conditions. And that will make more sense in just a minute. So let's see. Sarah, do you want to advance the slides? You're welcome to if you want to double click on them, or I can do that. Uh, okay. I think when you reset it, uh, I didn't. Oh, okay. I'll do it for you. Okay. Um, so this is just a, a figure that was uh, out of the IPCC. Uh, it shows what the predictions are for the future. Um, it also, a very similar looking map, shows that the high Arctic has been warming and, in fact, parts of Antarctica have been warming uh, 
preferentially over other regions of the world. Uh, and, and this diagram shows that that's going to continue as we look to the future. And a big reason for that is, is what's called the ice albedo feedback. That is to say, when you get rid of more sea ice and more snow and more glacier um, uh, coverage, then the surface of the Earth becomes darker and absorbs more heat. It's, it's really quite, a, uh, quite uh, simple and straightforward. And therefore, the amplification of that warming is going to take place greater in the high latitudes. OK, Sarah. Um, this is a, a, a couple plots that show how the temperature has changed on Svalbard. And I'll take you to Svalbard in just a minute. Um, the top diagram, sort of in orange and red, are the summer temperatures. Um, and we're really fortunate on Svalbard because the record goes back uh, into, uh, it's about 1912 is when we first started recording uh, data on Svalbard. Um, and uh, so it is one of the longest running records uh, in the Arctic. And so we're really fortunate to have this. The second diagram is the winter temperatures. And then the bottom diagram uh, is the mean annual uh, air temperature. And, um, and I think you can see a couple of things. One, you can see that it was uh, cold uh, right at the beginning of the record when it was recorded. Uh, that is thought by many to be the, the uh, last or the tail end of the Little Ice Age, um, relatively late on Svalbard. Um, and then you can see lots of fluctuations. And then you can, I think, see the recent warming um, that has taken place in the last decade or, or two. Um, and this is all great, and this is, turns out to be really important as we try to calibrate our record. Um, but you'll notice I have a question mark at the bottom of that diagram at the lower left-hand corner. And that question mark is, how about the stuff that's older? In other words, this tells us about, oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know who's pointing, but that's very clever. Um, uh, that tells us a lot about what's happening uh, for the last 100, in 100 years or so. But, uh, but how about if we want to look at centennial sort of climate variability or even millennial scale variability and look for patterns? Um, the simple answer is we can't do it with the limited historic data. And that means that we have to look for other uh, records of past climate. Next. And this means that we have to go into the proxy record. And a climate proxy is simply a record of something that has changed with changing climate. And that usually means changing temperature and or precipitation. And, and there are lots of proxies that people use. Uh, people use um, oxygen isotopes, so speleothems in caves, or they use uh, um, uh, the, uh, the assemblage of beetle parts in, uh, in, in either exposures or in sediment cores, or pollen assemblages that reflect past vegetation. The proxy that I want to talk about today is a sedimentological proxy. And it deals with sediment that originates from a, a glacier and is delivered to a lake system and then is deposited in the lake. Next. Yeah, great. And um, let's see, we had a few questions. Do you mind answering them before? Oh, sure. That, that's great. All right. I think it was this slide. And people were asking in the chat box, why South America, similar to the Arctic? Yeah, right. Um, that's, that's a really good question. I believe that has to do with the impact that is happening. Of course, everyone knows what's in that part of South America. Um, and that's the Brazilian rainforest. And, uh, and exactly what's going to happen with the rainforest in a, in a warmer world is a, uh, is a big question. But one of the concerns is that it will be replaced. And, uh, and it will no longer serve the same function. And in fact, we will, in fact, um, no longer have a rainforest in that location. Um, besides that, I don't know why it, the model suggests that area is going to be hit so hard. Um, okay. That's all I can, I can give on that. All right. And then Madalena is asking, I believe on this slide, is the lowest temperature before 1920 caused, caused by a volcanic eruption? 
Yeah, well, that's certainly one of the candidates for the Little Ice Age. Th this is one of the greatest ironies of, of the climate change story is that we lived through, we, humanity lived through the Little Ice Age. It occurred roughly from 1450 to 1880 um, in, in most parts of the world. Um, and we have records of it. We, we knew that the River Thames froze over, for example, uh, pretty routinely. Uh, we know about it because of, of uh, wheat harvests and uh, grape harvests and the prices associated with those commodities. Um, we know it, about it because of, of uh, reports that people were, were making about conditions. And yet we really don't understand why it happened. Um, it doesn't seem to be solar output um, because we've reconstructed that, we think, pretty well. Um, volcanic eruptions, especially closely spaced volcanic eruptions, um, might be a possibility, and that's, that's something that's getting a lot of attention these days. Um, it's also possible that this system that you've perhaps heard of the PDO and the NAO uh, and the AO, these are all sort of pressure gradient oscillations that affect what happens with the jet stream in the, uh, the mid-latitudes. Um, and that can affect how the jet stream moves and therefore how storms track. And so the climate system is complicated, it's dyna dynamic, and it's possible that, that uh, once we push it so far that it sort of takes on a new dynamic and a new sort of mode of operation. Perfect. Thank you. I'll go back to the slide that we were moving towards. Okay, and, and I guess, Sarah, will you just interrupt me if people have questions because I'm not seeing it come up on the chat. You got it, no worries. Okay, okay, so these sediment layers that we call varves, varves are like tree rings. So on the left you'll see actually a section of a tree and, and you could easily count those and figure out how old that tree is. But just like varves, or just like tree rings I should say, you can count varves. And not only does it tell you how old the tree is or how long the record is, but it also tells you times when the tree was growing more and the tree was growing less. In fact, the whole field of dendrochronology allows us to, to interpret those changes with regard to, to changing temperature and precipitation. Um, so on the right is a picture of some mud that was deposited in Glacial Lake. This is uh, Gail Ashley who was a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts, now at Rutgers. And um, it's a picture of glacial muds. And what you see are layers of silt and clay and silt and clay and silt and clay. And each one of those couplets represents one year. And so just the, the length of the hammer represents about 10 years or so uh, of sedimentation in that lake. And I want you to draw your attention to the, the layers that are just peeking out above the top of the hammer. Uh, and you'll notice that they're much thinner than the layers where the hammer is positioned. So again, that's telling us that in, these, um, in this lake at this time, there was a change. And that change is due to something. It's, it's due to um, the mechanism by which sediment is delivered to uh, this glacial lake. Okay, Sarah, let's go to the next one. So this is a, um, a picture of some varves. Um, and so uh, this is a close-up picture. And you can see silt and clay layers. The dark layers are the clay. And uh, the silt is the, the lighter stuff. The silt is deposited in the summer. Uh, it's a time when you have the glacier melting and, and the sediment being brought down into the lake. And then also you have open water conditions, no lake ice, so you have waves and currents, you have lots of agitation happening. And so you are able to transport and deposit silt-sized material. Uh, the sand gets deposited on the deltas and doesn't make it out into the lake very far. And then in the winter, the subsequent winter, of course, when you have lake ice and the glacier is no longer melting, uh, you have quiet water environment and then the um, the clay settles out. So you get this alternating summer silt, winter clay, summer silt, winter clay. And this is really useful because not only do, can you count these, and they get, so they give us a chronology of how many years 
are represented in our record, and you can tell what year is, is what. Um, but also their thickness is a proxy of the conditions during which they were deposited. Okay, Sarah, next. Perfect. And we have a quick question. Uh, would the term VARB apply to ocean sediments as well? It would if you could demonstrate that they are annual uh, cycles of sedimentation. Um, it, it's, I'm talking here mostly about what we call uh, textural VARVs. That is, these VARVs are defined by um, the size of the sediment particles. But you can also have chemical VARVs if a lake or, or even a, a, an ocean um, embayment or something has uh, a change in chemistry on a seasonal basis. Uh, you can get biological VARVs. Anything that shows annual cycles of sedimentation uh, will be called a VARV. Okay, sounds good. There's three more little questions here. Um, I'll let everybody know that we, uh, we've got lots of slides to get through. Um, I'm available to be here for another couple minutes after, after the hour, but uh, let's see. Here's some other short questions. Any spring or autumn characteristics worth noting? Yeah, sometimes, depending where you are, uh, you can get um, autumn storms. So you can get a rainfall event that will sometimes wash a lot of sediment into a lake that's not yet quite frozen. Um, it seems like in our lake that I, I want to get to here soon, uh, that the nature of the spring melt, that is to say how much snow is on the landscape and how that snow uh, ultimately melts. Does it melt uh, fast over a period of, of four or five days? Or does it, in fact, uh, sort of melt very slowly over a matter of a couple weeks? Uh, really can determine how much water goes down the fluvial system and therefore how much sediment is transported out into the lake. All right. Um, Madalena wants to know, is clay, clay is darker, isn't it? Yes. OK. And then Ken is saying, lakes in Maine turn over. Uh, does that happen in high latitudes? Does it impact the bars? Uh, good, really good question, uh, and that can be really important with regard to uh, whether or not you get varves at all anyway. And uh, if a lake turns over, it means that you're sort of oxygenating the bottom water and you're not allowing it to become stratified. Um, okay. So not all lakes have nicely preserved layered sediment records or, or varved records. Um, you either have to have anoxic bottom water conditions where you're, you don't allow organisms to burrow and, and churn up the sediment, or you need to have sedimentation so fast that the, the biologic elements uh, can't keep up with it. And, uh, and I think we actually have uh, both of those situations in Linnae. All right. All right. And I'll let you get through a few more slides here, and then we'll see if there's any more questions. Okay. Okay. So let's go to Svalbard. Um, it's uh, midway between the north coast of Norway and the North Pole. It's way up there. Uh, we go there because it's in the high Arctic, and there's very few uh, places that you in the high Arctic that you can fly a jet and therefore a group of people to. You try to do this in Greenland, and the price would probably triple or or increase by an order of magnitude. So Svalbard is in a, in a neat place. It's also at the end of the Gulf Stream. Uh, there's a little bit of, of Gulf Stream water that, that makes its way up along the Norwegian coast and then up to Svalbard. So it turns out to be in a sort of climactically, climactically significant position. OK? Um, our field site is located where the red dot is on the west coast of the largest island of the Svalbard archipelago, and that's um, uh, Spitsbergen, and uh, and it occurs uh, immediately adjacent, therefore, to that ocean current that I was talking about. Next, this is a view up valley. Um, so uh, to the west or to the open ocean is to the right. We're looking south, and you can see um, the lake. It's about a kilometer across and about a, a four kilometers long. You can see the glacier in the background. And um, so inflow comes from the glacier, and then the lake drains out out to the sea at the bottom of the slide. Next. 
Um, this is just a topographic map that basically shows the f same thing. The glacier is about six kilometers up valley. Um, it's a fairly simple little glacier system, um, fairly simple little uh, meltwater system, uh, and, uh, and a nice little lake. So uh, we think that this is a good, uh, a good little um, study area to study the details of the glacier, the river, and the lake. Okay. So uh, the ultimate question is, what controls the, the formation of these varves in this high latitude glacial lake? And, uh, and, and, and why do we see the layers that we see? And can we interpret climate from them? OK? When we take a sediment core from the lake, and there's a couple of different ways to do this. This is just a, a, a short core. The top is uh, on the left, and you go deeper into the mud, and you can see some nice changes. Geologists like layers, because layers tell you that things are changing. And, um, and they're changing for a reason. And, and, and what we need to do is get smart enough to figure out what those, those layers mean. That mud is beautiful. We're always excited when we see nice layers like that, but you don't really appreciate the layers until you actually impregnate the mud with epoxy, uh, mount it to a glass slide, and, and, um, and grind it down like you would a, a rock thin section so that you can actually see the individual uh, layers. So let's go to the next one. All right. Julia just said, that's some beautiful mud. <laughs> Um, so this is what the mud looks like. On the right is a thin section. You can see a scale there. So we're talking about sub-centimeter scale uh, laminations. Uh, the top of the core is up at the top. Um, and so we're going back, and you could count those layers. Um, the dark represents the clay, and the, and the lighter bands represent the silt. And, uh, and the question is, what do they mean? And can we reconstruct climate from them? OK, next. When we do this down the core, when we get down around 30 centimeters or so, um, the layers look different. Um, the clay bands are not as thick. Um, and even the, the, the silt bands are not as thick, although there is one right in the, the middle of the, of the figure. Um, so there's a change, and we're very intrigued with that change. What does that change mean as far as lake ice, as far as glacier melting, snow cover, so on and so forth? And I like to think of these layers as almost um, like a barcode. Um, and so I put that barcode on the, uh, on the side there. And um, you know, like a barcode, that barcode is a language, and it means something. Um, and you know, so you can have a barcode that means Del Monte peaches or, or Hunt's ketchup or something like that. And um, so our varves are a language that we're trying to understand. And nobody gave us the, the book on how to learn the language. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn, learn the language of the varves. OK. So um, in a nutshell, we want to know when the sediment gets deposited how it gets deposited, and under what conditions uh, is sediment brought to and deposited in the lake. OK? So these are the things that you could imagine might be important, how much the glacier is melting or not, the temperature of the air, because that influences the, the snow melt and the glacier melt, and, and also the temperature of the inflow stream and the temperature of the lake water, uh, how much snow is on the landscape and how that snow melts. And then, of course, um, the, the amount of rain that, that happens and the intensity of the storms can all influence how much sediment gets washed into the lake. OK? Um, so let's look at the glacier a minute, that, that area way up at the top of the, uh, the, the photograph. Um, this is an oblique aerial photograph that was taken by Norsk Polar Institute in 1936. And uh, we're going to zoom into it, hopefully, in the next picture. And you're going to see that the glacier is very plump. It's very, um, very healthy looking. And it's right at that moraine where I have the, the red dot um, shown. And this is one of the curious things, is that although the Little Ice Age was over in 
in Europe, for example, uh, about 1880. Um, we still had the, the glaciers at basically their maximum little ice age, age position uh, until 1936. So I think this is telling us something about ocean circulation and also sea ice conditions around Svalbard. Okay. Um, so there's that red uh, line um, where I have it uh, shown as, as 36. Um, this is a 1969 photograph and showing the glacier margin in 1969. And then the bottom figure is where the um, ice margin was in 1995. Uh, okay, next. And if we do this for all the air photos that we have, including now we, for the last 10 years, have been walking out the margin of the glacier every year. Uh, so this, this slide has not been yet updated. Um, but you can see the 2,000 year margin. And, uh, and, and it is probably another, oh, on your screen, a couple centimeters further up valley from that now. So anyway, the, uh, the take home message from this is that the glacier has retreated about 20 meters, 17.7 .7 meters per year uh, is the rate of, of melting back of the glacier ice. And this says nothing about its thickness changes or its, or its uh, um, uh, the volume, the ice volume. Yeah, that's okay. You can go ahead. Um, so we're studying the glacier where we're, uh, we have these metal holes that we drill into the ice. Uh, they're like dipsticks, if you will, and the, the glacier will, will get buried in the wintertime. The, the poles will get buried, um, and we can figure out how much snow and ice accumulates, and then we can also figure out how much snow and ice melts in the summer. Uh, we also use them in the summertime to figure out daily ablation, relating them to air temperature and moisture and, and humidity and solar insulation, so on and so forth. Um, and we've had students study various processes that are causing the glacier to melt and the amount of debris on the ice and that sort of thing. And then ultimately um, try to figure out how much sediment the glacier is, is releasing as it's melting. Okay? Great. And I just want to say, too, that um, one of the focuses of the class is, of course, geology, limnology, everything that you guys are working on out there, but also technology. So what do people use out in the field? And um, this is a good example, and I think it fits really well into STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and math. And so it's a, a good piece on technology and engineering. And Missy has some great journals about the um, creativity that your students have had with technology and, and materials and tools. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, there's a, we, I, I haven't mentioned a lot of other sophisticated, I mean, um, uh, technology that we're using to document the conditions. Uh, we're measuring solar insulation. We're measuring uh, with actually a little radar device uh, that is hanging over the glacier, looking down to actually record the glacier lowering or the melting of, of the glacier. Um, and, and we have a weather station on the glacier itself. So, so there is lots of good technology. Um, we're concerned about the glacier mass balance. This is now for a glacier that's been studied by the Norwegians, which is um, north of us by a little bit, but it's a very similar sized glacier facing the same direction and so on and so forth. Uh, Mitra Leuvenbrein is, um, has been studied since the, the mid-60s. And the red dashed line represents a break-even point. And if you are above that line, it means that you've accumulated more snow and ice in that year than you lost in that year. And if you're below that line, it means you're operating at a deficit. It means that you're, if it's a checkbook, you're spending more than you're taking in. And you can see why these glaciers are melting back. It's because they've been in a negative mass balance state for all but a couple of years. And then if you look at the, the recent um, years and since 2000, um, they've actually melted back quite a bit. Okay. Um, so we're, we have a couple automated weather stations in the valley. So we're, we're measuring conditions, um, air temperature, wind direction, wind speed, rainfall, solar radiation, um, and uh, barometric pressure, humidity, um, so on and so forth, including ground temperature. So students have all these data, and uh, the sample rate is, is 30 minutes. So we have lots of data to play around with. 
and try to make some sense out of when it gets warm, what happens in the valley. Okay? Uh, we also have a couple of automated cameras, and these are our eyes, well, mostly our eyes. I was going to say our eyes and ears, but they don't have any microphones on them. Um, we have five of these throughout the valley, and they, they are taking pictures twice a day of different uh, parts of the valley to record, you know, when does lake ice form? When does lake ice melt? When does the stream start to flow? Um, um, what is happening with regard to the amount of snow on the landscape? And so on and so forth. So these are these are really wonderful tools that uh, even a decade ago were uh, were not available. Okay. We got a question here. Uh, Ken's asking any ground penetrating radar. The researcher he mentioned earlier that he'd like to work with uses ground penetrating radar. On yeah, we don't. We we thought about doing that. You can use that to, um, in some cases, measure the thickness of the glacier. Uh, the amount of glacier ice, and that would be really neat to quantify. Um, there have been people using it on Svalbard. Uh, some Norwegian colleagues have used it to determine the thickness of the debris over ice cored moraines. Um, but we haven't used uh, ground penetrating radar uh, in this field site. Okay, we're also monitoring the, the inflow stream. Uh, this is, uh, you can see some people measuring the discharge of the amount of, or volume of water that's moving through that cross section um, in the background. And then the inset picture is um, a, a woman carrying a boulder that we, uh, that we put out in the middle of the river and we hope to find it the following year. And so far we always have. But it's got a, a temperature logger on it. And so it measures the temperature of the water and you can see the stream getting colder, 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 and then all of a sudden uh, going to zero and that, that tells us that in fact the, the, um, the, the stream is shut down, is no longer flowing. So we're interested in the amount of water moving down the stream, the amount of sediment moving down the stream, and the temperature of that inflow stream because that will ultimately determine its density uh, when it enters the lake. Okay. All right. And we have a translation question. I'm going to go back to the uh, plume cam. Can you uh, say that in another way? What is the exact meaning of plume cam? Oh, sorry. It's a translation <laughs> for Italian. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the plume cam is a, uh, the pl a sediment plume is just simply a cloud of sediment water that, that we can identify uh, going out into a lake. And so we often, with this camera, can see plumes of sediment billowing from the inflow stream into the lake. So we just sort of give this a casual name of plume cam. We also have a glacier cam. We have a glacier up, a glacier down cam, um, and so on. But a sediment plume is just simply a cloud of, of turbid water uh, coming out into the lake. All right. And from Ken, do the remote sensors, CAM, and TEMP send you data, or do you have to be on site to retrieve it? Yeah, we have to download them. They, they do have an uplink uh, for the weather station, but it's expensive, and we find ourselves needing to be there every year anyway, um, and sometimes twice a year. So we typically will um, just go, go there, maintain and inspect all of the, the systems, and then download them at that time. Right. Julia says she loves how simple some things are, a boulder and a thermometer. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's a, it's a data logger, so it's a, you know, a little computerized thermometer, if you will. So it's taking measurements every, every 30 minutes. And are we on the right side or one more? Uh, one more, I think. Okay. Uh, we're also concerned about what's happening in the lake. And so we have deployed throughout the lake at different uh, sites and at different depths at those sites, uh, these sediment traps. And uh, these sediment traps are just simple funnels that uh, have a certain cross-sectional area. And the sediment settles out of the water column and accumulates uh, in those what we call the receiving tubes, the clear um, plastic tubes. And there's a, um, I think it's a it depends on the funnel size, but I think it's a hundred times or 110 times amplification 
That is to say, the cross section of the funnel is 100 times greater than that cross section of that receiving tube. So what it does is it gives us sort of an expanded uh, record of what is being deposited on the lake bottom and allows us then to sample it and analyze it in, in much higher uh, uh, resolution. Um, and this is what it looks like in the water column. So the, the blue bar is supposed to be the water surface. We have a buoyancy device uh, in yellow there that is basically uh, um, a, a flotation device that they use for lobstering and, and grabbing and things like that. And then we have an anchor at the very bottom. And uh, of course, the, the rope connects the two and is pulled tight by the buoyancy of the ball. And then to that, we attach temperature loggers and uh, sediment traps and in the springtime, uh, turbidity meters so that we can, in fact, monitor uh, what's happening with regard to uh, uh, different places and different depths in the water. Okay? So we want to monitor all these things. And then we want to, in fact, develop a calibration so that we, we can say when the layer is like this, it represents warmth or it represents more snowfall. And if we can establish that calibration, then we can go back into older sediment uh, that, we, that we see in our lake cores to interpret past environmental conditions. So, so study the modern system understand it well enough to, to figure out what the layers mean, and then use that understanding to interpret layers in the prehistoric record. Okay? Uh, so this is maybe a good place to stop. Uh, this is the end of the first part. I want to talk next about um, the Polar Trek teachers, but uh, are there any questions about, um, about uh, what we're doing up there? All right. Anybody want to ask a live question while they're thinking about it? Ken is asking, when you have a minute, do they fish? <laughs> There's, um, surprisingly, there are fish in the lake. They're uh, Arctic char, and, uh, and y yes uh, and no. They're not interested in lures so much, uh, and so the only way to really catch them is with a gill net. And oftentimes we're too busy to, to do that, and there are regulations about who can do that and where they can do that and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, mostly what we've done is we've gotten chummy with some biologists that are coming through studying the char, and they can catch them, and when they catch them, then we eat them for dinner. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of people are just typing away, but um, I think you can keep going. Is this a picture of Dan out there? Or who's yeah, that? So, so this is this is our this is Dan Frost. He's our current uh, polar track teacher. Um, he's also a former student at Bates College and a former student of Mike Rattel, who's uh, one of the researchers this summer on Svalbard. Um, and uh, and. I don't know if people have been following Dan's blog, but I think it's excellent. I, uh, I'm really impressed with his photographs and with his, his uh, summaries and descriptions. Uh, Absolutely. But, but um, I was gonna, this is a good point, too. He, um, he tried to get a journal out real quick today just for us as we, he knew we were meeting with you, and so I'll put the link up here. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely outstanding. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's really, really cool. And, uh, and I think he is working out really well in the field, in part because he had a research experience as an undergraduate. And uh, so this is quite familiar to him. Um, so so what's, what's in it for the teacher? You know, why would a, a, a teacher want to do something like this? Uh, so we get, we get a series of, of photographs here and, uh, and stuff. Oh, I went into screensaver mode. Hang on. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> first of all, we are, um, the, the teacher will be part of a really interesting and dynamic group. group. Um, we're really fortunate to be able to be selective of the students that we, we take. Um, they're not uh, all from Mount Holyoke or Bates or Hampshire. Uh, in fact, oftentimes only one of them is. These are from across the nation, uh, and they are, people who've expressed an interest in, uh, in the Arctic and in climate change, and, uh, and they're wonderful, and they're, they're really motivated. 
And so Missy is uh, off on the right-hand side. She's standing in the back. And, uh, and she was an excellent member of our, our field team and was intimately involved with, with all of the research projects and went into the field uh, almost every day. In fact, we had to hold her back a, a few times. OK. Um, here's Missy at uh, firearm uh, safety training. Uh, everyone needs to be able to handle safely and use uh, a rifle for polar bear protection. Uh, we sometimes see polar bears. We've never had a, a dangerous incident, uh, but all it takes is one. And so everyone needs to be prepared. And so uh, one of the things that uh, I've observed, uh, some people are more comfortable with hiking and more comfortable with firearms or more comfortable with uh, heavy packs. Um, uh, this was, you can see Missy getting uh, special attention here. <laughs> and I think we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's a, a, an opportunity to learn a lot of new things um, because each student project is uh, a whole area in itself. Uh, in some cases, we might have people studying the size of lichens growing on different glacial deposits or um, this summer, I know one woman is, is uh, sampling boulders for cosmogenic dating, and other people are working with the sediment traps, and other people are, are working with uh, the weather data or the, uh, um, the uh, camera data. And so there's uh, lots of opportunities for exposure and involvement in, in lots of new things. And then taking that data home to use it for their classes. And uh, because they've uh, been involved in collecting it, they, uh, uh, it, it's meaningful and they can convey that excitement as well. OK. Um, and of course, there's lots of, of neat things. Uh, my experience is, is that uh, most of the teachers that we've taken up, this is sort of on the edge of what they've ever done with their life. And so to be able to go out and, and not just survive, but actually enjoy being all, out all day in the rain and, and to hike to these peaks to, to get these big overlooks is, uh, is really memorable and very, um, very exciting for most people. OK. Um, here's Missy with uh, a, an ice core. One of the projects we did um, uh, her year was we actually had a um, sort of a, a, an ice coring device. It was a, it was a small scale um, like ice auger thing, but it was able to reco recover a core of glacier ice. And the student was sampling the glacier uh, up the center line of the, of the glacier uh, and measuring the oxygen isotopes um, variation in that ice. So here's Missy uh, cradling one of the cores that we recovered. OK. And, um, and as far as um, the involvement, uh, one of the, the things that we as researchers benefit tremendously by is um, what is NSF refers to as broader impacts. And that is to say that uh, no longer is it OK for scientists just to go out and do their thing and to learn you know, what they learn and publish it in scientific journals. Um, it, we need to. Uh, and we are expected to uh, get the word out and, and publicize what it is that we're doing and, uh, and, and get that information out and, and spread the excitement. And uh, the Polar Trek teachers do that really, really well because we are often too busy and, and we often don't have uh, time to, to do it the way we should. So if you look at, at Missy's um, uh, blog, it's really impressive what she's been able to do um, um, and, and how she presents the science, what it is that we're doing, and, and make it accessible to um, the other teachers and, and students. Um, OK. And um, so from my perspective, and the reason why we've been, uh, I, I think we're, we must have sort of frequent flyer sort of uh, bonus points with Polar Trek because I think we've had a <laughs> teacher um, every year, if I'm not mistaken, and um, and it and it's because I think 
everyone wins. The, the teacher has a great experience, gets energized, and learns a lot of stuff. The students really enjoy having the teacher around and, and, and enjoy conversations about what it's like to be a teacher and to consider teaching as a career path. Uh, we get help uh, with the broader impacts, but we also get help with uh, group dynamics and, and uh, another adult in the field. Um, it just is a a win-win situation, and we're we're very fortunate to uh, to have had Polar Trek teachers uh, work with us. And I think right. that's the end. Good, perfect. Hey, wanna wanna tell us what R E U stands for? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, R E U stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates, and it's a program that's been at NSF for over a decade now, and. Uh, in fact, probably two decades, and it has grown as we've realized that we've got to give undergraduate students a research experience that gets them excited, gets them hooked, gets them uh, engaged in science and engineering and technology uh, sorts of projects. If we don't, uh, we've, we know that people will drift away and they'll do some other things with their lives. So this is real money that NSF puts up to, to try to foster interest and, uh, and provide good experiences to undergraduate students in hopes that they will uh, continue um, in science and engineering and technology areas. Perfect. Thanks. Um, Julia was just wondering that. And um, we just had a little conversation here quickly. There was a couple of people asking what year that Melissa, uh, Missy went out, so I was letting them know it was 2008 with the same researchers. Yeah. Um, and um, Bruce had a question earlier. Bruce, are you available to ask that question live? It looks like he's typing, so I think he's just going to, yeah, Mike isn't working still. Okay. Uh, let me scroll up here. We were talking about Dan's uh, most recent journal, and I'm not sure you've even seen it. Albert was a good one here, or you were mentioning it. Um, the, his, his data this morning showing some recent cooling spikes in T data at lake bottom recently. Why is that? Is it because of melting going on? Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, one of the things that can happen um, is that there can be a complicated interplay almost on an hour by hour basis between the density of the inflow stream and the density of the lake water. And, um, and those things are changing. Mostly inflow stream temperature is changing and sediment concentration is changing. So, so when you think about the density of those water masses, it's, it's governed by how much sediment particles is in it and also uh, the temperature of it. And you can get situations where the inflow water is more dense than the lake water, even the, the bottom water of the lake, and you can induce underflow currents. So, so water from the inflow will go in and sink and go to the bottom of the lake basin. And uh, that water might be colder than the, the present lake bottom, and it might have more sediment in it. And so if they saw a spike, it probably means there was an underflow of cold, dense water. Hmm. He says there was an increase in all T uh, and T at all levels between July 12 and 13. Uh-huh. So increased temperature at all levels on those days. That almost sounds like it could be the lake overturning. Hmm. Mm. I don't know. have to look at the data. All right. Good question, Bruce. Uh, there's a couple other people that are typing here. Uh, another question is, are you doing any isotope work or looking at pollen to learn about paleo temperatures? Yeah, good question. Um, we, uh, pollen doesn't work on Svalbard because there's not much pollen generation on, um, in this high Arctic site. And most of the pollen that we get deposited uh, comes from the mainland, from Siberia, from, from Europe, and gets brought up with the winds. So pollen doesn't work and is, it doesn't really say much about anything local. Um, the isotope work that we've done, we did have a student looking at the 
isotope composition of the rainwater one summer, and we've had students looking at the isotope um, concentrations of of the glacier ice as well, and uh, in in how that varies going up the glacier. Um, but that's that's it so far. You you can use by the way for people who don't know isotopes, you can use isotopes uh, as they've done in Greenland and Antarctica as a proxy for temperature, and um, and therefore um, basically the more negative the oxygen isotopes, the colder the snow was when it condensed, um, and and therefore you can reconstruct what the temperature was. Great. Here's a question from Julia, um, and maybe we'll do one or one more after this. So, does the lake turn over twice a year? Yeah, it's an it's an interesting situation. It turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that. But um, you you can imagine in the winter time, uh, it is stratified, temperature stratified. The the coldest water is close to four degrees centigrade uh, near the bottom, and uh, it actually is colder underneath the ice, closer to the surface, but remember four degrees C is the is the maximum density of water. Um, it's complicated because we now know that there are um, groundwater sources of water. And that those groundwater sources of water are coming from limestones on the east side of the basin. And that system, that karst system uh, apparently stays active throughout the winter and actually brings in uh, calcium sulfate into the the lake and and I think and that builds up in the bottom water of the lake and that is one of the reasons why the lake becomes anoxic uh, in the winter time. Um, I mentioned that it has varves because of rapid sedimentation rates but also um, because of anoxic conditions and I think that the Calcium sulfate helps with with that deposition or with 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 the, that condition. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. What else? I guess that's. I'll stop there. Okay. No worries. She's just fascinating. Yeah, this has been great. I love to just get that in-depth look of what's happening. It's a really great way for us to start our course, as well as understanding why why in the world it would be good to have a teacher out there. And of course, Polotrek knows why that's a good opportunity, and many of the teachers on this uh, presentation right now, some are alumni of our program, and some have been taking advantage of the of these journals in their classrooms. Mm. Uh, is there any, it doesn't look like anybody else is typing at the moment. Um, if you do have one more question, go ahead and post it. Uh, there was a question from Julia earlier about um, Polar Trek and if there was going to be opportunity for our Polar Trek teachers in the, in the coming years after this next grant. So um, some of you are aware we have one more year on our grant uh, and we are going to be opening up our application period this week. So we will send out some information if you're on our polar education uh, email list. Uh, Bruce has a good question. How's the food on Svalbard? <laughs> well, th this gets a little embarrassing, Bruce. I have to say, um, you'd think that this is uh, really tough to do research up here, um, but it turns out we are staying at a base camp uh, that has running water and has beds and has showers and our meals are, are provided for us as part of the, the package. Uh, it's a bit like Tulik. I, I, I think I heard somebody um, spent some time at Tulik. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a bit like that. And so, um, y you know, it's a little bit embarrassing um, because it's pretty cushy. In fact, most of our, our alums they go off and do real field work after this, uh, where they're living in tents and, and having to, you know, weather rain, uh, week-long rainstorms, and uh, and they can't dry out and everything else, and and it, they're they're in for a rude awakening. Um, but with that said, there's no way that that uh, the governor of Svalbard would let us camp, um, it just out on the landscape there. The the impact would be too great. And from my perspective, the exposure to polar bears would be too great. 
it's one thing to be hiking around when you're aware and, and looking around, uh, and it's a whole different situation when you're sleeping. And so uh, for that reason, we use a base camp, and it just happens to be very comfortable. Perfect. Um, <laughs> Yeah, people are saying, oh, that sounds great. And, and Madalena was joking, and she said, haha, you only eat fish. And then she said, surely you don't have good Italian food. No spaghetti, no pizza, and no wine. So, <laughs> Madalena, you'll have to go up there and compare and see what happens. Yeah. But um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I want to say thank you to you, uh, Dr. Warner, for joining us. And we'll be hearing from Missy next week, a little bit from the teacher's perspective on being a part of an REU. And uh, we're all going to stay, most of these people are going to stay connected for the next week or so um, and the following week in this course. So we'll be chatting along. Um, and maybe if we have any questions, we'll just shoot you a quick email. That sounds like a great plan. Um, okay. Thank everybody you all. Saying, yeah, everybody's saying thank you so much. This was great. Uh, yeah. Okay. My pleasure. <laughs> and uh, good luck to everyone. All right. Take care. Thanks so much. You bet, Sarah. Bye-bye, y'all. Right. Thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, have a good rest of your day. And a lot of us will be chatting online through the course. Welcome.